Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, so this will be the first lecture in a series. We'll see how many lectures there will be, uh, where I will attempt to write a visual odometry system from scratch in C++ and stream and record the entire thing. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment, so let's see how it goes, and hopefully it will be useful. I will keep an eye on the chat, so feel free to ask questions there as we go. So let's see, we got everything working. Can someone in the chat let me know that they can hear me okay? So I just know that the mic works and everything works as intended. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so the kind of the points of these lectures are two parts. One is to kind of show how. So I've been been. I've held some C++ lectures uh, previously, and this is kind of an attempt to actually show how to use C++, at least how I use C++ in a real-world context, where we actually use it for something real, instead of just uh, showing snippets or fake test programs. Uh, I think it, it will be a lot more clear once you see it used in actual for real world scenario. Um, and the second is to maybe teach some robotics concepts as well. Uh, I will shortly explain what the visual dome JS system actually is. But uh, I hope this doesn't want actually need you to know any robotics concepts from before. I will try to explain everything as we go. Uh, and hopefully you should probably know some programming at least have touched C++ before um, but hopefully well I'll try to do it in a way such that you can pick up as we go along uh, both C++ and also the robotics concepts okay let's actually get going um, <clears throat> So to start, I just want to explain what are we actually trying to build, uh, which is a visual odometry system. And a visual odometry system is a is a program that attempts to compute the path of a camera using just a video stream. So given a stream of images, uh, often on, on some robotics platform, or an autonomous car, or an autonomous drone, or whatever. Given this stream of in images, try to compute the path that the camera is taking to the world. Uh, this is, of course, very useful for autonomous application, and it's kind of a, like one of the basic algorithms in almost all robotic systems. So we have this stream of images. And we're trying to compute, say, some camera path over time, both translation and rotation in all three dimensions. I'm kind of drawing it here in 2D, but of course what we're trying to do is in full 3D. And as you can imagine, some, some camera moving through the world, kind of pointing this, this way here, and then turning, and then turning over here as it's moving. And the way we're going to do this, we there are of course a lot of complicated way to do this, but we will try to achieve something in a in a simple way uh, to have something that is manageable for me to actually implement on stream. So what we're going to do is uh, is first we're going to take take the image of some scene. 
and then we're going to try to detect useful key points like what are the points in the image that are easy to track and then we're going to try to track those over multiple frames in 2D to kind of track how the different parts of the image move in the image. So you can imagine something like, yeah, draw the same scene with some other scene. So by having some camera that tracks this point from multiple images, uh, given enough of this point, this is actually enough to allow us to compute how the camera moves, of course, assuming that the world is static, which it isn't. That isn't totally true for all scenarios, but we will try to build a system that given a static enough world is able to compute a reasonable estimate of how the camera moves. <clears throat> Yeah, um, of course, feel free to ask questions in the chat at any point, and I will try to, to keep up to date with the chat and answer them as we go along. So the plan is to do this for 90 minutes, and we're about eight minutes in. Just gonna put on a timer so I don't forget to stop. <clears throat> okay. So, so when I mean from scratch, I mean totally from scratch. So this is what I'm starting with. Uh, I will be providing, I created a GitHub repo, which I will post uh, together with the recording of these lectures and also in case uh, there isn't really much in the repo now, but for next time, in case you want to pull down the repo from last time and kind of follow along, uh, that should be possible. So right now there isn't much, there's really just an empty folder. And the only thing I have is here a dataset folder. And if you look in here, there's a small download scripts and it downloads the dataset that we're going to use. Um, this is a data set that's publicly available from the Technical University of Munich. You can see the URL here. Uh, so this has a couple of things. It has some acceleration and it has a ground truth, which is very useful. So you can actually see how well we're performing. Uh, so this is actually taken with the RGBD camera that also has a depth channel. Uh, maybe we'll use the depth channel, maybe not. I'm not sure yet. Let's see how it goes. But what we are definitely going to use is the RGB channel, which images basically look like this. They are quite low resolution, which will be useful for our purposes because then we won't have to operate on so large images. Things will run faster. We can we can try to run on a bigger uh, data set with large images later once we get this working. But this is like a nice small, simple data set we can get started on. As you can see, it's just like a simple office scene that camera moves around. Yeah, also RGB uh, PNG pictures. Um, yeah, there's also some accelerometer data here. Oh, it's actually empty. Okay, never mind. Uh, yeah, we're not going to use that anyways. So we're just going to use visual geometry, not visual inertial geometry. So we're going to use data. So, yeah, data So my goal from today, uh, so what I'm hoping to achieve today is just to be able to write a program to load those images and display them on the screen because we're also going to write our all of everything of our visualization. We're also going to write ourselves using OpenGL. 
uh, which is a very useful skill for animal working in robotics, is the ability to write quick and efficient uh, visualization. I found that super useful in my robotics works. Uh, so yeah, so for today, uh, our goal is just write a program that loads in a series of this file and just displays them on screen. So there's some boilerplate we need to get started to actually get up and running. Uh, let's see. So for this program, for this project, I'm just going to keep it super simple. I'm going to use make as the uh, build system. So yeah, make file. And this is just, this will be a simple project. We will try to keep everything as simple as absolutely possible and make is, is a very simple build system. So let's see. So make is defined in a make file where you basically write rules uh, for targets and then how those targets are executed. And also dependencies on the target. So we can just write something. This is creates a target hello and to run the target. Uh, say go. So now I have this make file here. If I run make, let's increase that. Yeah, you see, it runs. It runs echo hello world. It's, it also prints out every command, which is, is kind of useful so you can actually see what's going on. Also, make file becomes a little bit more, uh, more complex. Uh, and basically, make always runs except. It basically detects if the target exists already as a file. Of course, now we're not actually creating a file. So when we run make, the rule always run. But if I, for example, were to create a file called hello, so now I see I created a file here called hello for a make, now nothing happens because, oh, if there's a file there already, I don't need to do anything. So that's kind of the basis of how, how uh, make kind of decides if it needs to actually run a command or not. So remove that file again. So let's actually do something useful. Can anybody in the chat let me know if like the text is viewable? Is it okay to read? Hopefully it's readable. Yeah, that's great. Okay, let's create an NCC file. So just regular all. So let's just get up and running with a hello world. So now to actually compile this, uh, we'll need to create a target. Visual DOM tree from scratch will be our project name. So now we actually need, we will use, just use G++, which is the C++ compiler with GCC. Uh, I personally prefer Clang, but G++ in, is installed with every most Ubuntu systems so that will make it easier for people who try to follow along at home. It will almost certainly be installed on in your systems. Uh, so basically what we need to do is just give it and then so that all just gives it the output like the output executable we want to create. 
and now we're in make. Now it's EG plus, we compile this file. Yeah, now we can run the execute. <clears throat> of course, a problem right now is what happens if we want to change. We made a change in the file and now we want to recompile it. If I run just on make, it thinks it's probably like VOFS already exists. I don't have to recompile it. You will see I get the same old output with just a single uh, exclamation mark. So basically what we have to do here is we have to add as a dependency. This means that this rule depends on this file, meaning if this file changes, uh, make is smart enough to actually look on the edit times and it keeps like a cache of when what when what was the last edit time when I used when I run ran this rule and if the edit time of the NL dependency changes and it knows that it needs to run the rule again. So I think, yeah, so now so now it runs again. See now I can run I can run it twice and then it knows. Yeah, so now it's updated. And Change it back. Yeah, so now it keeps compiling uh, stuff that we need when we make a change. Uh, make can also have variables. So a common one that is often set is something like this. We can more easily if you want to change the compiler later it's also possible to use environment variables from amp side a lot of linux systems set cc as the environment variable cc to the c compiler and csx as the c++ compiler uh we won't do that here but just for just to show you how variables work yeah but delete this yeah so now c plus g plus Okay. Yeah, so we're going to need a couple libraries. I generally try to avoid using big complex libraries as much as possible because they add, like, adding a library isn't free, it adds complexity. Um, Complexity makes your code harder to work with, but uh, for our to actually achieve what we want, it makes sense to use a couple libraries. And these are quite small, clean, and simple libraries. We will use three of them. Uh, small. We'll use GLFW, which is a library that basically handle uh, handles windowing for us because we want to create a window and we want to create an OpenGL context so we can draw in that window with OpenGL. And that handles the that's basically a library that handles simplifies this for us for both the uh, X windowing system that most Linux system use and it also works with Wayland. This is the new upcoming win uh, winnowing system that is probably going to replace X at some point. Uh, also going to use a library called GLAD. This is an OpenGL loader. Um, so basically the thing about OpenGL is that it's it's not it's not really one library. It's more of a specification. So there are many different ways to implement OpenGL. Uh, so, for example, on Linux you have Mesa. This is an open source implementation which has very limited support 
for GPUs is it's there's also a CPU implementation of OpenGL. Uh, there's a closed source implementation from NVIDIA and I believe also AMD as well. So uh, there's basically some complexities in basically getting loading OpenGL and getting the function assigned, basically set up the function correctly into the library. And this is something that GLAD happens. We won't actually use the loading part of it because that is handled by GLFW. But we will use it to basically provide us with a header file with all the OpenGL function and also to populate those function with pointers into the library loaded by, uh, loaded by GLFW. And to actually load the PNG images, we want to use something called FTP image. Well, that's PNG is a compressed compressed image format, so uh, and compressing those is a little bit involved. And SDB image is just a really nice clean library that allows you to to load a tons of difference of image formats and get them basically in the get them in the straight RGB pixel format, uh, which is what we need both to run computer vision stuff on and also to display it in OpenG. Uh, okay, let's just get started. So we can just start by GLFW. Um, so it's basically... This is the library. Um, it's a really nice, clean, simple windowing library. It, it provides some other stuff like keyboard, mouse, audio. We're not going to use so much of that, just some keyboard maybe, but yeah, it's generally really clean, nice and easy to use library. Uh, for most Linux distribution, you can just install it. That's usually what I do. Um, so I've already installed it, but if you're on Ubuntu, it's basically W3 slash dev. Make sure you get the dev, or otherwise you actually need to have to actually get the header files, which we're going to use. So you see, I have, I have already installed it, but yeah, that should install it on your machines if you're following it not. So uh, the next we need is actually the GLAD library. And the GLAD library is a bit special because it's not one single library. You actually, so I'll show you. GLAD OpenGL should be able to You kind of, it's more like a library generator almost. Uh, which is kind of a crazy concept, but basically you specify some parameters and then it generates the file for you. Um, so language is basically self-explanatory. Uh, one thing of note is actually going to select debug here, C++ debug. It adds some real nice debugging functionality, which it makes it should makes it easier for us to debug our OpenGL code. I'll show you actually what it adds later. Uh, but select that if you're following along. And then OpenGL. GLX is basically uh, is the library to kind of interface directly with X, and which is the Linux windowing system. WGL is a Windows uh, GL system. And EGL is kind of a cross-platform headless like if you're writing if you ever want to write uh, for example like OpenGL code on raspberry pi which has a screen but no like windowing system then you can actually do something like that with egl or even like headless run OpenGL code without the screen connected and stuff like that uh, but we're just doing gel and um, we're not going to open gles which is like a mobile light version of OpenGL for mobile devices. And so OpenGL has a lot of different versions, but I would, if you're not really sure what you need, I strongly suggest selecting 3.3. So the reason for that is basically 
from three and after OpenGL changed a lot. It's it works in a totally different way, and that's basically like three point three and later is kind of is kind of the oldest of the quote unquote modern OpenGL. So unless you know that you need something that is only available in later versions, just select three point three. That's a, that's a good starting point. You can always upgrade later if you need to. Uh, like. In this case, it wouldn't actually matter because it would just generate like the functions out of the latest version. But we're just going to yeah, we're just going to use three point three. It should be fine. Uh, we can keep it simple that way. And we don't need to generate the loader because GLFW is going to do that for us. Yeah, thank you for somebody mentioned that. Yeah. Firefox but a little bit small, so yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, this should hopefully show better. Yeah. So debug, OpenGL, yeah, and profile, core compatibility just adds like like it remains support for some deprecated stuff, but we're not going to use that, so we can select core. Yeah. Version OpenGL 3.3, .3, we're not going to use any extensions, and we're not going to generate a loader and generate then it generates the file for us and we can just use this zip file And just clean up the folder. I don't see the downloads from before. So, yeah, just going to download again so I can show you more clearly. Yeah, so you get the zips, you get this cloud folder. Yeah, good source. So, just copy this glad folder to our directory. Yeah, that is here. So it's just three files, uh, basically. So, okay, now we want to compile that library. Actually, use it in our uh, in our program. So we need to update our make file. So I'm going to do this. Dot O is an object file. So just going to write out some stuff. So basically, this dash C means just do compiling, don't do linking. So this dash, dash O file isn't that executable. It's just a object file that we can later link. And we're going to create instead of going to do this here as well. And then we're going to run. So we're creating a object file from our own stuff and from the GLAD stuff. And then we're linking them together to create our final executable. And did this actually work? Like VOFS, it relies on VOFS O being made and GLAD. This might, might not work. Yeah. So we see that in basically the DSC file, it includes the header file in GLAD and you can't find it. Uh, so what we need to do, we need to tell it where it can find that header file. So we will create a new variable here. So 
So the way you pass include file to GCC and Clang is is like capital I, and then the path it can be an absolute path or it can be a relative path. So we're going to just use relative path relative to our uh, library here. Yes, it's glad include. So we're just going to use include. You see. Yeah, so this uses the path glad slash glad.h, and you see also this include file is set up this way. So usually when there's an include file in like a library that is, like the path should be to inc an include file, and then usually the includes, if it's set up correctly, it should kind of start from the include folder to where the, where the file is. So you see this is in a folder called glad and glad glad.h. This is where our, what we use here. So it doesn't work out because I have to actually use uh, actually use this. Yeah, so this will add like the touch that I glad include here. So we're actually going to use this header file in our code as well. So that's why I made it a variable so we can add it here as well. Yeah, and now it compiles. So I happen to know we're not quite done, but let's just keep going until we hit another roadblock. Um, so basically now we want to create the window using glfw. So we want to include glad, glad h. Yeah, never mind this saying not found. It's just I haven't set up like my editor correctly. So I can probably so speed stop. So it's just my editor can't find it. Like the compiler can't find it. Um, uh, so yeah, one like weird quirk. So basically one weird quirk here is that it actually is kind of annoying, but our, the order we import stuff actually matter because uh glfw actually includes its own open gl stuff like unless it's already included so it's actually quite important that you include glad before glfw like we see here it's super annoying but yeah can we make yeah so since we're now able to compile properly that is able to find. So the reason it's able to find glfw here, like we haven't added it in the include here, but it's still able to find it. And the reason for that is it's looking, so by default it's looking in, basically in this folder. This is like a system-wide include folder. So when you install a library through apt, it gets added here. So you see, yeah, here is glfw and here's the file we're including. So it will look in the system. Uh, I believe it looks in path you are given it first. And then if you can't find it in the path you are given it, then it will look in like the system. So that's why this work, even though we haven't added it in our make file. Uh, okay, so now we're going to start calling glfw to actually get our window set up. 
Get this a little wheel. So first you have to call jlfw init, which is basically initializes the uh, jlfw system. Um, I'm wrapping an if around here so I can detect it if it fails because it returns false if it fails. So print f. So what I'm doing here is fprintf allows us to write a file, either an open file or, of course, on Linux, everything's in files. So like the error pipe is also a file. So basically this, instead of printing like to the regular out, it prints to like the error, uh, which allows, we can like separate those streams and do different things with it. It's just a bit like more correct to actually, uh, actually I put this on the error output. Let's see, does this compile? Does not, and if I'm going to deal with, yeah. So basically you see, if you notice here, so we're actually able to compile main, like this runs without uh, issue, but it's actually at this stage when we're linking together the glad.o and the ofs.o, that's when the error happens. So this is a linker error. This basically means that we're able to get include files we know like this glfnet function exists but we're not able, like it's not defined anywhere. So the reason for that is that we actually actually link the GLFW is not a header only library, like there's stuff, there's implementation stuff that we have to link against that actually defines how all the GLFW functions are, are actually implemented. So what we need to do to get that working is, let's see. I'm going to create a new variable here called libs. And basically the way the flag you like just like you pass dash capital I to have an include path, it's dash small l for to link against the library. Um we'll be looking in Lib, nice user lib is here. Yeah, I will do for now, but somewhere in the system path is looking is GLFW uh, library file, which is which is it's able to find a link against. So let's see, still not working. Okay, yeah, I'm not actually using this. So let's add Yeah, now it works. So now we're linking against GLFW. So the linker is able to find okay, here's the implementation of GLF in it. It patches that, it links that into our program and it works. So yeah, now it's apparently the GLF init function works, so it's just, yeah, our program doesn't do anything interesting yet. So, let's actually create a window. So, and the way we do that is, 
seats. Enter. Should take a size, which doesn't really matter because it's just a start choice. It's not. Let's just pick something. Go from. Um, yeah, I'm not going to just find out for now what these two node pointers are. Basically, it's, it's basically if you want to create multiple windows that kind of share resources. But we're not going to use that now. This works, like basically this fails if window pointer is null, but I kind of like it. Yeah, so this might return null if it fails for some reason. Then we need to Let's compile. Does. So it might actually. I don't know if you, if you can see it on stream, but it's like something happens for a second so we are actually uh opening a window but then we're immediately closing it so that's basically what's supposed to happening here so let's actually make the window stick around uh, what we're going to do is create a while loop um glf has a function Glf w window should so glfw basically has a couple of way to listen if a window should close and this is basically like the single function we can check so until this program has received some signal that it should close keep running this while loop. This should work. I'm just going to yeah, so now, now we actually get a text mark is too small, but you get like just a black window that says VO from scratch. So, what swap buffer is, is so we're going to start rendering stuff into this image. And uh, it's going to look weird if we like edit the window as we're rendering stuff. So what's happening here is something called double buffer, which is like a super basic, pretty much any kind of rendering system on any computer uses at least double buffering. Um, so what that means is basically we have two image, image buffers and an image buffer is just like the image of the window. And we have one that we display to the user and we have another one that we're writing to. So we're displaying one, then editing, like writing, doing some things to the other, and when we're done, we switch. And then we display the one we finished writing to, and then we start writing stuff to the other. And you can have like three windows, which is called triple buffering, and then you can kind of render, render the beginning of something and render the end of something else to like the third buffer. So you have like one buffer you display to the user and then two buffers you're writing to at the same time. If you have seen this, a lot of games have like you can select double buffering and triple buffering. That will, that's what that means. So triple buffering, like the the reason you might want to use it is that you can sometimes render more efficiently by doing different kinds of renders on the different buffers. But that also increases input lag because basically the time from when you start rendering to 
until it gets displayed in the user and gets slightly longer. Oops. Something now. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's double and triple buffering, but we're not making a game. We're just going to display some stuff. So double buffering should be fine for our case. Uh, and this also, uh, we're going to add this. What this means is it basically adds vSync, which kind of synchronizes our switching buffers to the screen. So I happen to use a 60 hertz screen, so it kind of synchronizes. So this loop. Basically, when you have this enabled, it's just going to slow down this loop. Basically, this swap buffer will block. Of course, this, this loop runs really, really fast now. Much faster than 60 FPS. Way much faster. But this basically blocks it, so it kind of syncs it to the screen. We can look at maybe separating out. So basically, now, if we were to implement stuff in here, like the, the speed of our algorithm would kind of be locked to the refresh rate of the screen, which we might or might not care about for our simple use case, but yeah, we can look at detaching them later, but for now we're just going to let them be locked. Okay, but now the, we have this black window. I kind of want to be able to close it but with press escape because now I have to kind of like control C here. So we're going to keep adding some stuff. And so we're going to add some functions. Going to add this function. Which is basically an error callback that GLF will call if some error happens. Basically, it tells GLF how we want to be notified if an error happens. Uh, which should make debugging easier if something goes wrong at the midpoint. And to actually get GLFW to use this, we're going to call it right. We have to init GLFW, but we want to get like the error callback function as quickly as possible. Uh, so what we do is W set error. So in case this syntax seems strange to you, like we're writing the name of function, but we're not calling it. We're not like we're done. We're not doing this. We're doing this. And basically what's happening here is I'm passing a function pointer. So I'm passing a pointer to this function to GLFW, like passing a, a function pointer is a way to basically pass how to call a function around in your program. And we're passing a pointer to our function that we have implemented to GLFW, which basically tells GLFW, if you want to tell us about an error, call this function. And I have to know, so basically, but to able to pass a function like the the function interface has to be what the pointer expects. So basically, we can call this function whatever we want, but it has to have void return value, and it has to have like the first parameter must be an int, and the second parameter must be a car car pointer. But like the 
the function name and the parameter names can be whatever we want, but the, uh, the signature of the function, which is the return type and the types of the function parameters must be what the function pointer expects. Just like you can't, like a pointer to an int isn't the same as a, as a pointer to a float, just the same, like a pointer to a function that takes in an int is not the same as a function to a pointer that takes in a float, like those are two different types of pointer. Yeah, so now the LFW should be set up. Oh, wait. Uh, is it the ball? What did it do? Yeah, there we go. And I talked about wanting to press escape. So we're going to create another function that we're going to pass as a function pointer. Which has this. And by the way, so I happen to know because I've used GLFL before, but you can, of course, like, like if you Google these functions, you get. Let's see. Yeah, so here's the definition for like. Yeah, here's the setter callback. So GLFW is pretty well documented. And GLF error fun, which is the callback function. Yeah, so this basically shows, yeah. The function point you pass must have a void return type and an error code description. Yeah. <clears throat> so this would basically be a callback that GLFW calls whenever any kind of keys are pressed. Um, so when we press key on the keyboard while the window is in focus, uh, we should get this function called. Just to test if we can do... something like this. And then we have to actually tell GLFW to call this function. So that's GLFW. <clears throat> um, we set a callback function per window after we have created the window. So it's just the window pointer and then fill. Okay, let's go. Ah, I passed the wrong. So you see what happens when you pass the wrong. Basically, the function pointer signature doesn't match. I call it. I pass the error callback by mistake, and then we get the compiler. Oh, but then I. Uh, the right one. Yeah, how it runs. Cannot set without a current. Ah, okay. Don't worry about that yet. We haven't actually set up no GL context yet, so that that's why. 
uh, GLFW is complaining. But by the way, you see that our error callback works. So basically, GLFW is complaining that we are setting a swap interval, but we don't have an OpenGL context yet. We haven't done that work. So at least we know that the error callback works. So, but um, yeah, so basically, now I'm pressing some keys on my keyboard and I get like callback. That should be something useful here. So you see, I just get like numbers. So basically, GLFW assigns different numbers to different keys, but luckily we don't have to actually remember the numbers. It's the final line. If so this is the number. Of, this is basically a variable a defined that is set in the GLFW header, which is all set the correct number for different keys. So we are looking for the escape. And you might not have noticed it, but I got the same number both on when I pressed and when I released. So that's what the action is for. Action equals So we're just going to press down. I want to wait for the release. Uh, and now we're going to use the GLF view that window should close. Then we're going to pass the so I could pass I could pass in, I think GLFW is kind of set to pass as C library, I think, which doesn't have true and false. So I think, yeah, it's better to use this. This is set up to actually do the right thing. So yeah, this basically sets that this window should close and then basically this while, this while will change. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't explain GLF poll events that we have to actually call that to get the key callback. So basically this, this polls like keys and other events. So if we didn't call this, we wouldn't actually get the key callback because we have to give the program. We have to basically uh, tell GLFW to actually run through the events and then call the call the right correct callback functions. And this happens here in Polynets. Now I'm pressing escape and I close it. Great. So now that works. So red fix this OpenGL self. Let's actually create an OpenGL context. So GLFW window hints is kind of how it can tell GLFW stuff about basically different parameters that we want for um, like different attributes of the window. So basically what we're doing here is this X. Uh, so this GLF context Uh, this basically tells uh, GLFW, hey, we want OpenGL version 3.3 at least. Basically, we require OpenGL 3.3 support. So it might load a later version, but we shouldn't actually notice. Um, I 
think there shouldn't be any changes to basically function. I'm actually not totally sure if I believe it can load a later version, uh, but it shouldn't really matter for our case because I don't think we, I um, don't think there should be any difference. I'm actually not totally sure, but it should be fine. Uh, just be warned that it might load a later version, but I think it should matter for our case, but this basically test will need at least 3.3. And basically, if you if GLFW can't load at least 3.3, then it's it's an error, and the program's not able to run. So if you were if you were to create an executable and you try to run this on a really old machine that has a really old OpenGL version, then this will fail because of this because it can't find at least version 3.3. And that's also a good thing about using kind of. That's another reason why we didn't use like 4.0 or some newer version like 3.3. By using the oldest version we can, this application will run on like a wider variety of a wider variety of machines. Yeah, so this tells it to load major minor. So this is where the actual loading happens. So basically, this is a glad function, and then we pass it a function pointer. Again, lots of function pointers here uh, to a glfw function. So basically, we give glad a method of loading OpenGL through GL, and glfw is what actually implements that. And I believe it's run make. Yeah, so this won't work. Uh, okay, void. Yeah, so in this case, we actually have to cast the function pointer. I'm actually not totally sure it might be because because glad kind of defines its own but yeah this I'm actually not totally sure why it thinks these are different I'm not going to spend the time to look into that now but I basically for this particular case what we want to do is actually cast a pointer to what glad expects uh, to do that is it's reinterpret cast is it yeah Yeah, I believe it's because this is a GLFW function defined using the GLFW types. And Glad expects the function defined using their types, but it's actually it's actually the same type like as in terms of bits. So this does actually work. We just have to like get the compiler to accept it. So that's why we reinterpret cast it. So reinterpret cast basically means don't change this, just act as if pretend this is this other thing, but don't actually change the data in any way. And like static cast, for example, where if you started to cast a float to an int, like you would lose, like if the float is 4.2, you would lose the 0.2 and, and it, will, it just gets the 4. 
so the bits actually change. But reinterpret cast, it means don't actually change the bits, just pretend this is something else. I believe this should work. It's not. Uh... Oh, that's stupid. I wrote this in the totally wrong place. Here. Now. Hello. Yeah, now it comes. Okay. What did we miss? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so what we have to do is So, what I add here is make context current. So, an OpenGL context is basically so OpenGL is this stateful thing. Like OpenGL has a state, you call function, and then you change the OpenGL state in different ways. Um, and that state has to be saved somewhere. Like you should be able to run two OpenGL programs at the same time and they should have like their own state. And basically the context, the reason two OpenGL programs doesn't mess with each other is because they have each have their own separate state. So a state uh, context is the state of the OpenGL program and all kind of resources like textures and vertices and every, everything you are kind of uploaded to the GPU in that OpenGL context. And what make context cur current means is so an OpenGL is for the most part so an OpenGL is basically not uh, thread safe so you can't you can't render to OpenGL from multiple threads that is some of the things that newer APIs like Vulkan fixes but yeah there are there are kind of exceptions like you can actually do some OpenGL stuff from multiple threads, but that's, that's kind of more involved and it's not something we're going to use, almost certainly not going to do in this, this project, but yeah. But for the most part, OpenGL is single threaded. So you have to kind of like associate the context to a certain thread and make context current basically tells, okay, this context belongs to this thread. For now, we just have a single thread and if you, for example, wanted to create a new thread, like now we have the main thread running the main program, say we wanted to create like a second thread and like now we want this to be the random thread, then we would have to call make context current in that thread to kind of move the OpenGL context over to a different thread. Uh, we might do multi-threading, maybe not, we'll see, but not anytime soon. And in any case, we're probably going to be using OpenGL in the main thread, even if we do multi-threading. So, but we still need to call it like once. Um, so, yeah, we make the context current to our thread. And this function basically makes. So. So here's the glad file. And it basically defines find some yeah it defines tons of defines constants. Now here you see like all the different all the different OpenGL functions. Uh, and basically what load does is actually populates those because these are function pointers. So if you were to call uh, any OpenGL function before 
we call this glad gl loader, we will basically be calling a null pointer. Like it will be a function pointer to null. So that will, would of course crash. And this loader basically populates this pointer like correctly into the OpenGL library that glfw has loaded. Of this. Yeah, so now we have you know, GL context, so we can actually start drawing stuff in OpenGL. Let's see a convention. Yeah, so the simplest thing we can start doing to actually just check that GL is actually working is just clear the buffer. So yeah, as I said, OpenGL is a stateful, it's a big state machine. So basically what we're doing here is we're setting, well, not the state machine, but yeah, it has states and a lot of the OpenGL function is around setting states and then executing some command on that state. So GL clear color basically sets the clear color and then we, called clear clear which basically draws a single color to the entire frame buffer so remember this swapping back and forth like OpenGL won't actually clear stuff by itself you actually have to when you get back the the frame buffer after it's done displaying you have to actually clear stuff yourself if you like want to the common thing is basically clear it with a solid color and then you start drawing on it so if we now hopefully we just see something other than black and we do so basically that's what this clear color does this is just this bluish color which we're setting here this yeah now it gets on like a pink color So we don't have a ton of time yet. So maybe, yeah, I think maybe we should start setting up. Yeah, let's see if we can draw something more interesting to the screen and time me on left. So now my code is getting slowly messier and messier. And it's about to get a lot messier once I get starting getting the OpenGL stuff in. So basically a way I like the code is um, something I heard someone described it as compression-based programming. So it's easy to feel like you kind of design decide the system first, like you okay, I want this function, I want this these structures, and then you kind of fill those out. But then you have to actually kind of know how the system looks before you implement it, which unless you're implementing something you implemented before, that's that's really hard. So the way I like to implement stuff 
and I would highly recommend is is just like get the code down, like get it working. Don't, it's going to be messy. Don't it doesn't really matter. And then once you actually have the code for something, then you can start think about how I'm going to structure this and clean this up. Because every single time, like you're not going to be able to predict exactly how the code is going to look once you get it working. So let the code that actually works dictate how how the program should look, not some preconceived notion of how you think the program should look. So that's why I'm just going to throw stuff in. It's going to be messy, it's going to be one long main function. And then once I have something working, then I'm going to start, okay, this can be a block, pull this out in function, and so on. So does this still work? No. So the way OpenGL works, so um, basically uh, most of OpenGL drawing is around meshes. So you basically have this pipeline of different shaders. So, so what we're going to do, we want to explain, we want to load images from disk and we want to display them like a movie, uh, one image after the other. And then we're going to like, then we're, when we're implementing our computer vision stuff, we're going to draw more stuff on top of those images to better see what we're actually doing. Um, so what we actually want to do, so in our window, this is our window, uh, we're going to create a mesh. It's going to look something like this, as has to be triangles. So the basic, every single OpenGL rendering program has a vertex shader and a fragment shader. So a shader is basically just a small program that runs on runs on the GPU. Um, so basically, yeah, this is good. So OpenGL has this concept of the normalized device coordinate. And basically, so this is norm normalized device coordinate. Basically, everything that gets drawn on the screen has to be sometime, somehow be transformed into this. Uh, so it's like a cube um, with, yeah, basically from minus one to one in every axis. And notice it's uh, it's actually left-handed corner system. It's yeah, it is and it isn't. It depends kind of how you uh, how you kind of view the data and how you upload the data. But it's easier to think about it as basically left-handed corner system. Although that that's easy to fix. We'll make that final conversion uh, later at some point. Um, and basically the vertex shaded job is, so you have some mesh somewhere and the vertex shaded job is to transform all these vertices 
into the normalized device coordinate. And this this is just square. Like if you if you want basically whenever you have perspective rendering in OpenGL, uh, what you're actually doing is is so basically this is like the viewing direction. So for example, say you have this box, and you wanted to render that in perspective. Basically, things further away are smaller you would actually transform it. So basically that box becomes, it's like seen from above, you would transform this into something that's more like this. So in some, it, in some sense, every everything in OpenGL that's perspective is kind of faked somehow. You're kind of squeezing things that are far away from the camera down because everything has to be put in this normalized device coordinate. And then once everything is put, um, it's not correctly too, but, but simplifying a little bit, once everything is put in this box, we basically stamp all this object down to like the viewing planes we view from this direction. And then like uh, everything gets stamped, stamped into the frame buffer one by one. So the vertex editor job is basically this transformation. And then, of course, then we have to actually somehow get this into pixels. Uh, basically. So the vertex shader is run once per, per vertex, usually. Basically tells each vertex compute how the vertex should be transformed into this normalized device coordinate. And then the fragment shader is run after this. And the fragment shader is run well, once per pixel, basically. Uh, so if this If this square were transformed into the normalized device coordinate, then the fragment shader runs one per vertex. And then afterwards, we run the fragment shader one per pixel. Let's have one here, 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 here. Yeah, I think this will make more sense once we actually get the code. Although that is probably not going to be today. Um, I see that we are getting close to our cut of time. So I think I'm actually not going to start implementing that right now. So instead of starting slightly on something and then having to break it off, I think instead we're going to, if there are any questions, please ask them in the chat right now. Uh, otherwise, I'll think this is a probably a good spot to, to stop and then we can continue with actually implementing, implementing stuff in OpenGL next time. Yeah, so as I've said a couple of places, I also plan to upload. I recorded this lecture and I also plan to, I will be uploading this to YouTube. Um, and I'll also post a link to the GitHub repo. So after I'm done recording, I'll make a commit, like commit day one uh, or at least lecture one. And then you can check out that commit if you want to follow along from next time. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Uh, thank you everyone for 
watching, those of you who watch this live. And also thank you for everyone watching the recording after. And I'll see you next time.